What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So I'm not really sure where this video is being uploaded, whether it's on the main Spawn Wave channel or the second channel, Spawn Wave Plus. The reason for this is because YouTube yesterday randomly decided to strike the Spawn Wave channel because I sourced, get this, xbox.com. The YouTube bot saw that and said, we're not having any of this Xbox stuff here. You're getting a strike and you can't upload for seven days or even live stream. So here's hoping they're able to resolve this. A lot of good people have reached out to me attempting to fix this with YouTube so we can still have the spawn cast this, uh, this weekend. Anyway, we still have a lot of stuff to go over today and we don't miss mornings for Newswave here. We have to really go over a game that's been in the making now for nine years. It looks like it's finally going to see its reveal. We're also going to be talking about Nintendo's new strategy here for the Switch to get more systems on store shelves for the holiday. And we're also going to be talking about Embracer Group because out of nowhere, they just started making a bunch of acquisitions. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button. Helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave or the Spawn Wave Plus channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're going to start today with the Prince of Persia Sands of Time Remake. This is a, a game that's also gone through it a bit as it was delayed and then delayed again and basically been put on the back burner indefinitely. And it's even been moved away from its original studio within Ubisoft. Well, something interesting happened uh, the other day. We can see this. It looks like the trophy list for the game, or at least a game called Prince of Persia Remake, went live kind of out of nowhere. And this, of course, is leading to all kinds of speculation that we are getting close to a re-reveal. And in fact, looking through the trophies, I mean, there are some uh, some spoilers in there for the story for uh, Sands of Time. So I, maybe at this Ubisoft Forward, they have a re-reveal. I just figured this was a game that was gonna basically be missing for a while as they went to retool and fix it up for its next big, I guess, blowout presentation after it failed to impress the last time, but we'll keep an eye out on Ubisoft Forward. Remember, that is happening September 10th, so in about three and a half weeks. Also, we do have Soul Hackers 2 coming out next week. We had talked about the Famitsu review that went live uh, yesterday, but it looks like all the other reviews just went up as well with the embargo lifting, and we can see it now over on Metacritic, currently with a score of 77. That's on 29 critic reviews. Looking at the split, 17 positive, 12 mixed. We have some like 90s with digitally downloaded. Uh, we have the Mako Reactor. CG Magazine gave it an 85. Hey, poor player with an 80. And then moving down on the other end of the spectrum, you have like a Game Informer, MGG with a 65. And some of the some of the things that are really positive about this game, basically all this all these reviews said it was very stylish, had kind of that that Atlas flair to it, which is great. Uh, but some of the characters themselves, while they were interesting, it appears that the game being about 30 to 40 hours didn't necessarily add up to a very satisfying experience and payoff, at least again, according to many of these very vague reviews. This is a game that you're probably gonna have to play for yourself to see how obviously the story uh, plays out there. But if you've been looking forward to Soul Hackers 2, it looks like at a 77, I'd say that's pretty good for a JRPG like this and is being a bit more niche. Check that one out next week. Oh, and it looks like we do have another delay here, which at this point, I should just make a section of the show to go over what's been delayed. It seems like it's like every week something else is getting pushed a bit. And unfortunately this time, it is a game that I was really looking forward to because it's very unique looking. We can see this posted up. It's high on life. They say delivering news and then don't yell at me. They say the good news, high on life is still coming in 2022. Uh, the team at Squanch Games is working hard towards developing the best gaming experience at your screens and a little extra time is uh, time to squash some bugs never hurts. With that in mind, our new launch date is set to December 13th, 2020. So that, that feels like the last possible minute that they can uh, release this thing. I mean, it was what, coming out in, that was in October. So, okay, it's getting pushed basically two months. Not too bad. At least it's still in 2022 as this is one of my more anticipated titles. Also going right into Game Pass. And the biggest thing is it just looks so different from everything else around it. So I guess we'll have to wait a few more months to check this one out. Kind of similar to Evil West. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Nintendo and their strategy to ship more Switch systems out this holiday. We've heard all about the issues with supply chain and the chip shortage, and we're seeing it happen in real time where basically these companies, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo, 
are just unable to produce enough systems with the PS5 being like the big one that's just Sony's having such a hard time getting them out to store shelves. I mean, have you really ever seen a PS5 on store shelves? I haven't still. But the Switch, I have seen on store shelves. However, I will admit they do sell out pretty quickly. And now, Nintendo is looking to make the overall supply chain process, specifically the shipping, get a bit easier. And I first saw this and I was like, why is this such big news? But people had a lot of takes around this one. So let's, let's take a look here. This is posted up over on Nintendo Life. Nintendo to reduce Switch packaging by 20% to combat supply issues. So this, this was reported by Nikkei, and the biggest thing here is they're gonna shrink down the red box Switch specifically, which if you see those in stores and you see them next to the Switch OLED box, yeah, they, they do seem quite a bit larger, and I, I guess they're gonna try to shrink it down to around that size. I'm wondering if they'll go to the same kind of like vertical orientation for the box where they have kind of that, the, the Switch OLED box set up on its side uh, and then kind of standing up. I think that would probably be the best way to do it. In fact, they should just use that box. I mean, the Switch OLED and the regular Switch are roughly the same size. And in terms of shipping process and cost, it makes a lot more sense for Nintendo to do that considering 20% less in terms of each packaged box. I mean, across millions of units that are being shipped, yeah, that's gonna add up pretty quickly. Now, the thing I also wanted to point out here is there have been a lot of uh, people speculating that Nintendo would be discontinuing the red box switch and making way for some other system or just getting rid of it because the switch OLED's there and to be, yeah, to be honest, if you're looking at those two models and you're like, do I want the regular red box switch that's 32, 32 gigabytes, uh, a dock that doesn't have an ethernet port and the OLED screen, all this, I mean, I would just recommend going up to the $350 model to get all the bells and whistles there. But in this case, it kind of seems like Nintendo is doing this because they anticipate this system at least being around into next year. And yeah, maybe that's when they start to pivot, whether it's to uh, something with a next gen switch or just a refresh of some kind. But at least for now, it looks like Nintendo is pretty happy with the three skew approach with the light, the red box switch and that OLED model. But yeah, these are really the lengths that these companies are going to right now to figure things out with supply chain and just getting these systems to stores. And it's, I mean, we see Sony redesigning and changing up the heatsink inside the PS5 for overall costs. And Nintendo, while they are still trying to build switches, they're also just trying to figure out how to transport them to different places, all of those logistics. So yeah, it's, it's definitely tough right now for these companies to figure this stuff out, but there you go, there's Nintendo thinking outside the box, or at least redesigning it a bit. Next up, let's talk about a game that's been nine years in the making. I remember seeing the original trailer for this game, it was it back in 2014, and I, I'm not even kidding, it looks like it's coming out in like the next five or six months, and that's Dead Island 2. In fact, it just appeared on Amazon seemingly by accident because after a couple of hours, it was pulled down, but of course, it's the internet, so we don't forget. We can see this posted up by Wario64. Dead Island 2, day one edition, PS4, up for pre-order on Amazon. They have the PS4 version, by the way, listed at $70. I think that's just the pricing for the PS5 and the Xbox series. We'll probably see like the, the uh, previous gen versions at 60, but um, hey, we'll see. Anyway, it's dated February 3rd, 2023, and this is indeed a brand new listing on Amazon because there was one before when it was originally announced and revealed, uh, but this one is completely different. We have screenshots to take a look at and even box art. We can see the Deep Silver and Dam Buster uh, studio logos down there, and there's even a full description for the game. They say Dead Island 2 is a thrilling first person action RPG that takes players across a brand new playground, stylish, vibrant, and flooded with zombie infection, explore iconic, gore-drenched Los Angeles, meet larger than life characters, slay countless foes in exquisitely bloody detail, and evolve to become the ultimate zombie slayer. They mention that there are six characters to choose from, each with your own unique personality and dialogues. You can fully customize the abilities of each slayer with their brand new skill system, allowing you to respec instantly and try out the craziest builds. So this is exciting stuff, mostly because I, I didn't think we'd really ever see Dead Island 2 again. It bounced around so much between different studios and publishers 
finally wound up with Embracer Group and they kept saying that it was actually going to come out and now it looks like they're prepared for a full reveal blowout for this game, which of course comes back to the idea of where are they gonna do it? Take a guess. Probably Gamescom. In fact, we can see this from Tom Henderson. It says Dead, I Dead Island 2 re-announcement is scheduled for opening night live at Gamescom on August 23rd. We've been hearing uh, a lot of rumors around this game being revealed before the end of the year. And this, I would say, falls in line for Jeff Keighley, considering he had Last of Us Part 1 ready to reveal uh, over, the, over the summer. And then it leaked out early on, uh, on the Sony website. And here we are now with... Uh, Dead Island 2 leaking out a bit early on the Amazon website. So I'm excited right now to see more about this game. I'm hopeful, but I'm also, also cautiously optimistic. It's pretty clear this game has had a troubled development history, but I enjoyed the first one, so here's hoping the second one is just as fun. Next up, let's talk about Embracer Group and how they just went absolutely crazy the other night. I mean, they were sending out press release after press release after press release, just acquiring studios left and right. And some of them were genuinely surprising to go over. Let's uh, let's take a look here. This is posted up over on VGC. They did a good job summarizing the, the different studios, uh, starting with Middle Earth Enterprises. So get this, Embracer Group now owns the rights to the Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit. Uh, that one is shocking to me. I did not expect to wake up one morning and all of a sudden Embracer Group owns the intellectual property rights for Lord of the Rings. Wow. Limited Run Games is another one that, that surprised a lot of people, including myself. Now, a lot of us know Limited Run Games, of course, as uh, doing collector editions for different games that are specifically digital and they bring them to, the, to, to life essentially through physical copies so you can put them up on your shelf. But there's something else with Limited Run Games. They have their own engine that's allowed them to sort of do this with older titles and rework them, remaster them for current platforms. That's the Carbon Engine. And I actually think that's why, or one of the main reasons why, uh, Embracer Group decided to acquire limited run games because think about what Embracer Group likes to do. They like to remaster old intellectual properties that they have acquired over time and they have a lot of them. They have, I'm not even kidding, hundreds of these of these intellectual properties that they've acquired in the last like six to eight years. So you kind of plug in that carbon engine and all of a sudden they can start just pushing out release after release after release, and maybe even take advantage of uh, limited run games and their uh, their overall ability to bring these games to like physical form. So in interesting stuff there. Tuxedo Labs, uh, they say they're a Swedish studio specializing in tech-driven games. The first title was Teardown. Tripwire Interactive, I saw this one, I was like, oh, that could be interesting to see what they do, because remember, they've created Maneater, which was actually a pretty fun game, Killing Floor, which is an awesome game, and then Rising Storm. We have Singtrix. They create uh, ver vocal processing effect technology for karaoke, gaming, and equipment. Tatsujin, that's Embracer's first Japanese studio, founded by Shoot'em Up Studio, Talplin's co-founder. Bitwave Games, Swedish studio with a passion for retro games. Gaiotech, that's gaming accessory brand. And there's one other one. It just, it just simply says another company within PC console gaming that for commercial reasons is not disclosed today. They did mention that it's like the second or third most, uh, I guess, valuable in terms of the overall transaction amount. So I was kind of thinking, I'm like, all right, Middle Earth probably costs some money, right? That, that's probably a big one. And I guess Tripwire or maybe even Limited Run Games. So I was trying to think of like, uh, I guess another studio or company. And it's hard to say because you see some of these studios pop up in these press releases and you have to kind of go look at what they exactly made. Techland kind of crossed my mind, but we'll see. I'm kind of thinking it might be a smaller acquisition in like the grand scheme of things with what Embracer Group has. All of this though total is about $576 million. If you remember, when they worked to acquire uh, basically all the Western studios from Square Enix, they financed an additional $1 billion. So they spent a little over half of that here, which tells me they're still shopping. So uh, don't be shocked if there's another run of these press releases with all these new studios they've acquired, and especially one that apparently they've already made, but they can't quite tell us about it yet. And if you've been watching Newsway for any length of time uh, over the last couple of years, 
I've been saying keep an eye on THQ Nordic, also known now as Embracer Group, because they were making moves left and right, very aggressively acquiring studios all over the place. And now if you take their, really their wealth of intellectual properties and their wealth of studios and development force, it's, it's pretty staggering. And as I mentioned, they are right now working through 25 AAA level games. And then on top of that, it's over a hundred just overall that are in development. We're going to get to a position where they are just rifling off releases left and right. So I, I at least like what they're saying. They want to go back to more or less the roots of gaming, get away from the, the blockchain stuff and, and all this, right? Just actually release games. So, so far they've at least been doing that with these double A releases, but I'm curious what some of these triple A releases are going to look like. I have to assume Dead Island 2 is one of them and we'll see how that looks. Well, next week. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about the Famitsu sales charts. They had to take a week off. There was like a holiday that, that held up uh, one of the Famitsu reports, but we can see this posted. This is overall on, on install base form. It does a very good job kind of formatting all the information. Starting at the top with Nintendo Switch Sports, I, I want to mention the this data is combined for two weeks. That's August 1st to the 14th. Uh, we see Switch Sports at the top, 53,900 copies. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 did fall down a bit, 39,529, currently sitting at 152,257. This would be through three weeks. It is tracking ahead of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but I gotta admit, it's not as far ahead as I was expecting. This is just physical copies, and we know since 2017, when the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 released, uh, the gaming space has moved further and further towards digital copies for games, right? So. Yeah, the four and a half to five years, I'm sure, makes a pretty big difference in terms of that physical to digital ratio. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, 29,276. Then we have Kirby in the Forgotten Land, which is coming up on that one million mark just in Japan. So pretty impressive there. Monster to Rise, Sunbreak Set, Minecraft, Live Alive, which is now over 100,000 copies sold in Japan. Ring Fit Adventure, Gran Turismo 7, and then we have Momotaro Donetsu. Taking a look at the hardware across the two weeks, the Switch was at the top, 153,822. So just kind of cruising along there for the Switch. The PS5 though, 46,600, starting to look like Sony is getting uh, more and more stock out to Japan, so good to see that. And the Xbox Series, also cruising along, but yeah, obviously at a smaller number, 8,703. I do want to point out though, Microsoft is well ahead of uh, some of their previous uh, consoles, especially with the Xbox One. And I, I'm starting to think that this is going to be a system that reaches that 1 million mark in Japan for them. Obviously, look across at like the, the Switch and the PlayStation. Doesn't seem very impressive, but just for Xbox comparing to Xbox, that's pretty good. Then we have the 3DS at 307, and then someone found 28 PS4s in the back room. So overall, pretty good week, obviously, for the Switch and the PS5 to get more stock to Japan. Xenoblade Chronicles 3, while it is cruising along, I was just expecting maybe a, a bit more of a, a jump over Xenoblade Chronicles 2. This is still kind of a, a small scope of the overall sales, and we will eventually hear from Nintendo how it's done. I completely expect this to become the best-selling Xenoblade Chronicles game, no problem. Just like I said, thought it would have been pushing ahead of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 a bit more here, but we'll wait to see what Nintendo has to say overall with like the, the global numbers when they report to investors later on this year. But yeah, things rolling along there for Nintendo and Sony in Japan. And yeah, technically Microsoft when you compare it to Microsoft there. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. We ask Elden Ring is nearly 17 million copies sold already. Did you pick up the game? 42% said, yes, I bought the game. 27% said, no, I might buy it with a sale. And then 31% said, no, I'm not interested. So I'm very impressed with this, by the way, because Elden Ring is at 16.6 million copies sold. That was at the end of June. And look at the results here. There's still plenty of people who have not picked up the game. Wow, Elden Ring is just rolling along right now. It seems like it's gonna crash right through 20 million copies sold by the end of this year, which is incredibly impressive to do that within its first year with From Software. Now, now is the time 
to get Armored Core moving along because we see the From Software effect now really capping off with Elden Ring. Let's see what it can do for Armored Core. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Juno saying, I was literally saying yesterday how there's too many games coming out and now you're saying you can't catch up. I love this, uh, you're you're the best boy. Uh, if I wasn't playing Xenoblade Chronicles 3 right now, which is commanding a lot of my time where I'm just over 50 hours in now, I, I'd probably be able to get through these games a bit easier. Like, I'm basically switching between that and Roller Drome right now, which is which is actually a blast to play. It's a uh, pretty quick in and out gameplay. Like, you can jump in for five or ten minutes, get a run uh, done, and get some of the challenges completed. It's kind of like Tony Hawk Pro Skater with uh, dual pistols, shotguns, and grenade launchers. It's a blast. But I think right now, if you're looking around for something to play, because I know not everyone's into JRPGs like Xenoblade, I mean, try some things you may not expect to like, like Cult of the Lamb. I hear more and more people talk about it. I really want to try that game out, but you'd be surprised. Uh, it seems like people are just at least checking it out because there's not much else for them to play right now, which sounds crazy because I'm looking at my backlog, but either way, all of a sudden they're being pulled into a game they they didn't think they would enjoy. So that's my advice currently. If you're just kind of hanging out, you're like, uh, it's just, we got to get to Splatoon or, or, or something, else, Last of Us. Hang out and try some of these indie games because you might be surprised. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. It was Nintendo thinking outside of and then redesigning the box to try to get more Switch systems to store shelves. And then also what about Dead Island 2? Nine years in the making. Looks like we're finally going to see this thing. And then Embracer Group buying up studio after studio after studio. Do you think they're done or you think they have one more surprise up their sleeve? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.